welcoming Professor Angela Riley. have the clicker. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all here. How many of you are students? Raise your hands. Wow. Round of applause for the students. <laughs> you are the future. Um, I'm obviously delighted and honored to be here to, uh, to celebrate whiteness as property and my colleague and friend Cheryl Harris and also of course to be on this amazing panel with people that I so look up to and admire. Um, so thank you all and thank you for the wonderful work that you've done to make this conference um, the success I know it will be. I wanted to start by um, talking, laying a little bit of the groundwork for what I'm going to do. Um, I'm using Cheryl's work as a jumping off point um, to engage some of the questions that Devin just mentioned regarding indigeneity, race, and sovereignty. And in particular, I'm going to talk a little bit about the racialization of American Indians in some of the cases that laid the groundwork for where we are today. Um, so I have control of my own clicker. I think I know how to use this. All right, great. Okay, here we go. Um, as you can see, the title of my talk is Owning Red, um, a riff off of WAP. So the racialization of the American Indian, as many of you know, justified the dispossession of Indian lands, made way for white expansion, literally and philosophically, and concomitantly justified the deprivation of Indian property and tribal sovereignty. So for Indian peoples, this has obviously meant the taking of Indian land, the most obvious part of the dispossession, but also attempts to destroy Indian religion, culture, language, personal peace and security, and even Indian and tribal identity itself. Now in Cheryl's, I'll call it groundbreaking, not seminal, in her groundbreaking work, Whiteness as Property, she captures and engages the native within the landscape that was pre-colonial and colonial America. And in this way, Cheryl's work not only get, engages some of the philosophical, ideological, and doctrinal moves that facilitated the racialization of American Indians, but her work in characterizing whiteness as property, perhaps almost unintentionally, predicted a future in which redness is also a commodity in American society. And I'm going to engage that here at the end of my talk. Um, as I was telling a friend today, in other words, I am going to use whiteness as property as a jumping off point to take us from wampum belts to redskins in about 14 minutes. So bear with me. Um, for indigenous peoples, as is a common attribute of indigeneity of similarly situated groups around the world, this land here that we are on, by the way, this is Indian land. Thank you for letting us be here. Um, this land is holy land. Indigenous creation stories root Indian people in this continent, Turtle Island to many, as the focal point of life, creation, religion, culture, and language. And in the settlement of the country, the colonial powers initially, and then the United States subsequently, entered into hundreds of treaties with Indian nations to negotiate the transfer of land from, Europeans, from, in, from Indians to Europeans, often in exchange for peace and protection. And these treaties, as you will see, are embodied in numerous indigenous formations in the colonial era, and then are later put into writing with the treaty power ultimately confirmed in the U.S. Constitution. These vitally important and oftentimes sacred lands are the very places that commonly were most desired by whites and competing sovereigns for their vast cultural and natural resources. They are also the places which tie Indian people to all other components of their peoplehood, linking cultural, philosophical, religious, and political sovereignty all together and all rooted in place. But as you might know, this story changes at a certain point when the balance of power between the Indian nations and the United States begins to shift. And as it shifts over time, the colonial powers attempted to ignore treaties, break them, or use the courts as a means to justify the massive dispossession of land from Indians. So the very strength of Indian tribes, their unified culture, religion, worldview, language, and life ways, was used as a tool to racialize the Indian, homogenize the Indian, and justify massive dispossession of the continent until all pretenses of civility and respect had been fully disposed of. <laughs> 
So as Cheryl wrote in Whiteness's Property, Johnson v. McIntosh is the first major precedent in federal Indian law, written by Chief Justice John Marshall, which ultimately addressed this fundamental question. And it's an important question because the answer that this case gives us is still the case today. What real property rights did Europeans acquire and indigenous peoples lose by virtue of the European settlement of America? And the answer to that question lies, at least in part, in the racialization of the American Indian, of a colonized understanding of the red man as a primitive, uncivilized, pagan, non-Christian savage. The racialized Indian loses much in contact with whites, but according to Marshall's opinion, American Indians gain civilization and Christianity, bringing them out of the woods, literally, and into the light of the Christian God. We know that Justice Marshall construed Indians this way because he tells us in the case. Right there in the pages of his opinion, a case we still rely on today, a case that has never been overturned, the court adopts the international law rule of the doctrine of discovery as giving, rights, giving rise to property rights. He writes, the tribes of Indians inhabiting this country were fierce savages whose occupation was war and whose subsistence was drawn chiefly from the forest. To leave them in possession of their country was to leave the country a wilderness. To govern them as a distinct people was impossible because they were as brave and as high-spirited as they were fierce and were ready to repel by arms every attempt on their independence. So ultimately the court held that Indian tribes were the rightful occupants of the soil. They could occupy the land subject to purchase or conquest by the colonizing power, but they had no right to alienate or sell it. And this doctrine assured white expansion, but also gave the colonial powers the authority to prevent Indian tribes from treating with any other sovereign nations, and therefore lock the Indian nations into a sovereign-to-sovereign -sovereign relationship with the United States. So this creation of Indian title, where ultimate title is held by the United States, and the title of occupancy is held by the relevant Indian nations, remains to this day with the majority of Indian lands held in trust by the United States for the benefit of Indian tribes. So obviously a lot has happened since 1823, but history reveals that American Indians, much like other racial minorities, continued to be racialized, discriminated against, and subjugated through the myth of savagery of primitive status, a status tied to, but not entirely parallel with race because of the nature of Indian sovereignty. Because both Dred Scott and, Fe and, and Plessy feature so prominently in Professor Harris's work, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about their counterparts in the Indian context. Two cases which are reviled as completely and as thoroughly as those two cases, but neither of which has ever been overruled by the Supreme Court. Um, these two cases are the 1903 case of Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock and the 1955 case, note the date, of Teton Indians versus United States. So following Johnson, despite rulings by the court in the Cherokee cases that Indians couldn't be subject to state jurisdiction and deprived of their lands, pressure for Indian lands intensified until the federal government acknowledged it could no longer protect the tribes. The American president at the time, Andrew Jackson, purportedly held animus for tribal interests and is likely incorrect, incorrectly credited with the quote, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. So even though he probably never actually said this, he did say, and I quote, in his address to Congress about Indian removal in 1830, what good man would prefer a country covered with forests and ranged by a few thousand savages to our extensive republic filled with all the blessings of liberty, civilization, and religion? So at the urging of the president, Congress passed a series of removal acts which forced most of the Indians to Indian country, which is now the state of Oklahoma. This is, of course, the story of the Trail of Tears, the Trail of Death, and other government-forced migrations. So by the late 1800s, more than 30 Indian tribes had been removed to the Indian Territory, but the promise was that they would continue to live together without interference from the encroaching society and without the interference of state or federal law. But it turns out that Congress passed the Allotment Act of 1887 to end tribalism and to enact a policy in which the government would take Indian land and redistribute it in parcels or allotments to be held by a term of years by individual Indians or individual Indian families. And then all of the surplus lands would then be opened up for non-Indian settlement. 
Lone Wolf, a Kiowa leader, and others brought suit on behalf of the Kiowa, Comanche, and Apache tribes to challenge the abrogation of the Treaty of Medicine Lodge and to halt the government's allotment of their lands. The rugged individualism of the day, personified so classically in President Theodore Roosevelt, was on a collision course with the idea of collective tribal rights. In advocating for allotment, President Roosevelt said, I quote here, the time has come when we should definitely make up our minds to recognize the Indian as an individual and not as a member of a tribe. The General Allotment Act is a mighty pulverizing engine to break up the tribal mass. It acts directly upon the family and the individual. This of course was consistent with other assimilative policies of the day, namely the policy of the American government at the time to quote, kill the Indian and save the man. And though their race could not be changed, Indians could be taken from their families, deprived of their languages, their religions, their cultures, and brutally retrained for the domestic services to become workers for whites. So moving, um, the Supreme Court essentially, I'm, I'm running out of time so I'm going to move a little more quickly here. The Supreme Court in Lone Wolf ultimately held that there would be no substantive review of the treaty and that Congress could break treaties with Indian tribes at its discretion. A senator from Pennsylvania said at the time of the decision, Lone Wolf is a very remarkable decision. It is the Dred Scott decision number two, except that in this case the victim is red instead of black. It practically inculcates the doctrine that the red man has no rights, which the white man is bound to respect, and that no treaty or contract made with him is binding. After Lone Wolf's ruling, of course, fast forward now many years, I'm moving us to 1955, the year after Brown versus Board of Education. This is a case where the Supreme Court contemplated whether the taking of Indian property rights or Indian property from Native Alaskans, um, in this case particularly a group of Clinkett and Haida Indians known as the Tihatan, was compensable under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. Was it a taking? Again, relying on racially loaded language all throughout the opinion, the court decided only one year after Brown versus Board of Education that Indian nations only had permission from whites to occupy those lands and the Indian property rights were not constitutionally protected by the Fifth Amendment. In his opinion, Justice Reed writes, every American schoolboy knows that the savage tribes of this continent were deprived of their ancestral ranges by force, and that even when the Indians ceded millions of acres by treaty in return for blankets, food, and trinkets, it was not a sale, but the conqueror's will that deprived them of their land. Tihatan has never been overruled or repudiated by the Supreme Court. So as Professor Harris so, elo so eloquently wrote, whiteness is property, a privileged space within the American racial hierarchy. But in the face of settler colonialism, redness too became property, but it became the property of whites. With Indians pushed out of the way, either through removal, genocide, or policies of forced assimilation, whites were free to possess not only Indian lands, but Indian bodies, identities, and Indian cultures. The phenomenon of playing Indian by whites is well documented. Whites removed, killed, and destroyed Indian people and took their lands, but then took on Indian identities in a nod toward preserving the myth of the Indian squaw waiting to be conquered, like America itself, by white men or to supposedly honor the hyper-masculine myth of the fierce male savage in a war bonnet, ready to take up arms to defend his land and his people. And then there's this guy. <laughs> in my work um, with my co-authors, Kristen Carpenter and Sonia Katyal, we have fought against the idea that many scholars have claimed that Indian, playing Indian has become so ingrained in the fabric of America that Indians and Indian imagery now belong to whites. Articulating and defining these Indians, these images and iconography as the cultural property of native people, we argue that these cultural property concerns really in part address the issue of certain kinds of racialized harm. Proponents of Indian mascots like the Redskins, for example, contend that the mark doesn't just belong the, to them, to the team, but to Americans writ large, who have the right to depict Native Americans how they want, as they own them through decades of practiced rituals through sports. But in terms of understanding racialized harm, for many American Indians, the Redskins and other mascots keep alive a history of conquest and racial oppression. 
The term comes from the word that states used to place a bounty on the skins of Native Americans by inducing settlers and citizens to kill them and bring in the hides for pay. By reducing Indians to their ostensible color and the very skin that covered their bodies, the term facilitated oppression based on race, a social process that colonizers have long used to dehumanize and dispossess the colonized. So this, of course, ties in um, to many other sports mascots as well. So given that I'm running out of time, let me just conclude by saying um, the racialization of American Indians continues to impact the sovereignty and cultural survival of Indian people. The push for Indian lands and resources continues in America, but it's not just here. This is a global phenomenon going on all over the world today, as indigenous people see their lands invaded and occupied by those who seek to remove them and take their territories for capitalistic gain. There is a growing international human rights movement, and I note in particular the 2007 General Assembly's adoption of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It's worth noting that at the um, General Assembly that year, only four countries in the entire world voted against the Declaration. They were Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States. <laughs> since that time, all four countries have since reversed their positions, United States becoming the last country in the world to do so in 2010. Internationally, domestically, and tribally, Native peoples are pushing back against the colonial domination of their lands, their laws, their people, their bodies, and even their identities, even their redness, through the exercise of nation building and living tribal sovereignty. And I will just conclude by saying, after all of this time, I am very happy to say we are still here. Shimegwetch. Yeah.